Hello, welcome back to Movie Husbands. Today we'll be reviewing Anatomy of a Fall. Anatomy of a Fall is directed by Justine Trier and stars Sandra Huller, Swan Arlard, and Milo Mikado Groner. The film is about a woman suspected of her husband's murder and their blind son who faces a moral dilemma as the sole witness. So Matt, what'd you think of Anatomy of a Fall? I gotta say, I really, really, really loved this movie. I was gripped throughout it. I couldn't look away from the screen. I was really obsessed with this movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed myself. I think ultimately this film is really about the interpretation that we have of conversations. I think it really delves into what you believe of somebody's character and their intentions based on what they say. I think from a day-to-day -day basis, most of this is very benign stuff. But in this case, there's a murder involved and lots of these things are put into the public sphere. Suddenly there's a microscope on all these details you would think would just be benign or everyday. You know? Yeah, and so every little thing that our main character has to say or do is completely analyzed in this courtroom drama about what whether she did or did not kill her husband. Mm -hmm. I found it extremely gripping and mesmerizing, as I said before, and I look forward to discussing it in this review. Yeah, I definitely liked it. I seem to like it, I think, a little bit less than you did. Yeah. I think I got, this is, this is terrible to admit this, I think I got a little trailer fatigue because this movie has an amazing and very exciting trailer to prepare me for a movie that it wasn't. <laughs> it's much more of a slow burn courtroom drama that is very into its characters and very, very into ambiguity. I think if the film has any really great aspects Assets, that it's so committed to its ambiguity, almost to a fault, I think, in a way that I'll talk about later. But the film is very into the idea that you're going to interpret it from multiple angles. And mm. what these characters are saying could mean one thing and could mean another thing, which is quite a high wire act to be able to do for two and a half hours. And I do believe we saw a bit of that in the theater experience that we had, because I noticed people reacting in certain ways that I wasn't necessarily reacting. Some people were reacting with shock or laughter at certain moments that I didn't really feel that way. I thought a more serious note in some scenes. Of course, there is some humor built into this movie, which is it. very funny. There's also this way that the camera breaks the fourth wall. Sometimes it will do a quick jitter or a shake. And I think that is to mimic that the same film that we are watching is the same camera that's filming the trial that is taking very place. very interesting. Yeah. But one of the things I love about this movie is that I feel like the aspects of whether she did it or didn't do it at all are somewhat not as important as I think other elements of the movie. One of those being is that I think sometimes the movie is a little bit more critical of us and what we think about her rather than whether she did it or didn't. There is this big hoopla about the trial and there's a lot of shots that pay attention to other things besides her. There are plenty of moments that show TV crew mm -hmm. and how they are talking about the trial mm -hmm. <laughs> from her perspective. There's a really funny scene actually where she is on her bed in one of the hotel rooms and she's just watching the coverage of herself. <laughs> yeah, they keep putting in this little thing too before the TV reporters start talking that they're adjusting their hair and their earpiece. They're really calling attention to the fact that it's an artifice, this whole media attention surrounding the trial. Then that actually alludes to something that her attorney said to her at the beginning of the film when this whole thing started to unfold was that he warned her that this isn't about the truth. Yeah, that's actually in the trailer. She says, wait, I didn't kill him. And he said, that's not the point. He almost doesn't care because he knows pragmatically, he needs to create a story that's going to be understood by a jury, no matter what the truth is. That's his job, you know. Going from Sandra to the performance, which is also by Sandra Holler, so same name, same character name. <laughs> she was also just in the zone of interest. So this is two big performances in a year. But this performance I thought was absolutely mesmerizing. She had this extreme balance of her emotions from scene to scene that were so meticulously crafted after that they could lead you to believe almost anything about herself. Whether she is somebody who seeks to control her narrative in a certain way in little undertones, mm -hmm. little passive aggressive ways, or whether she is being very open and honest and just a genuine person. There are moments in this film where she just stutters over her words and stumbles over them. And somebody could interpret that as Oh, she's trying to get her story straight. Yeah, and she looks very stern a lot of the time. I'm sure we'll get to this. There's a pretty amazing scene halfway through of, that, of, of a recorded fight that she has with her husband. And the way that she looks during that, you can interpret as like a vague embarrassment, a breach of privacy that she's trying to conceal. Or you could interpret it as her being unfeeling inside because she killed him. <laughs> you know, it's a very interesting film in, in that regard. Uh, there's a lot going on there. Is she under so much stress and trauma from this experience that it is her reactions are coming out or manifesting in that way? That's the way she's dealing with her grief because everybody deals with grief differently. It's interesting because I immediately interpreted her as a fairly good communicator and someone who was honest when she needed to be honest. 
but maybe she's a master grifter. I mean, there are people that have seen this movie that think flat out she is just guilty. And that is the point of the film. And the point of the film is that you could watch it and you bring your own prejudices to the table in order to interpret it and say what you think happened. Yeah, and none of that would work without her performance here, which yeah, I think is magical. one one of the best of the year, if not possibly the best of what we've seen so far. Yeah, if we haven't had such a... a utterly stacked um, best picture actress race i would say that she has it but I, at the very least i hope she gets nominated so going from there i want to talk a bit about milo's character daniel because he was also very good in his own right i think he performed with such emotional restraint and expression he did a wonderful job showing how he's struggling with losing both his father and also crumbling under the weight of his mother and everything that's being revealed about her in this trial. Yeah. And so he has to come to terms of whether she did it or not for himself, for his own sanity, mm -hmm. and also whether he should support her or not. That is one of the big questions of the movie that does come to a head near the end. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that a lot of the film rides on his testimony. And there's a lot of tension going back and forth about what he's going to say in his testimony. I'm not sure if this is his first film, but he's certainly young. And I don't know how long he's been acting, but the back half of the film is really carried by him in a way. And some of that actually involves the family's dog. Yeah, amazing dog actor. <laughs> Probably one of the best dog actors I've ever seen in a <laughs> yeah. movie, honestly. Everybody is saying this. I thought I would be the only one saying this, but everything I looked at online is like, whoa, that dog actor. This dog has to do so many scenes. Some of them are actually pretty traumatic. There was mm -hmm. one particular traumatic scene that was very difficult for me to watch. I really don't know how they did it. I don't know how this dog did this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wish I could explain more, but I don't want to spoil the movie, but there's something that yeah. this dog does that is very emotionally distressing, mm -hmm. um, but it also plays a bigger role in that final part of the movie with yeah. Daniel. So I think kind of like Daniel learning about his family in court, he's learning a lot of these distressing details for the first time when he hears testimony and he hears things in court. We as a viewer are kind of put in that same position, right? I think a more typical film and maybe a film that wouldn't be quite as good as this one would instead use flashbacks. So when we would hear about something in court, we would see then an objective flashback to something that happened, which only happens once. The only reason that it happens at all is because they have a recording of it. So arguably what you're seeing is also objective because there's a recording of it. I think the film makes a very clear decision about whether it wants to show you things from the past or whether it wants you to learn about them in the context of either a testimony or mm. a prosecutor arguing or a defendant arguing. I think that's a very bold move by the film and something I really like a lot. And when I was talking about the film's commitment to ambiguity earlier, I'm really talking about that. Again, I like that quite a bit, but one of the things that concerns me about it is because the film is unwilling to choose a side, and I like the fact that it doesn't choose a side, but I think it loses some of the power in not choosing the side. It's so committed to ambiguity that I think that it... That is our dog. It's so committed to ambiguity... <laughs> Zoe, quiet. It's so committed to ambiguity that I think it sacrifices some of the power that it could have had. I know that this film is ultimately about a family falling apart, and I think it could have used a bit more focus on that, but it's so hyper-focused on the courtroom drama and the ambiguity of the courtroom drama, which again, very admirable and very interesting. I really could have used, I think, a bit more of an emotional weight to pull me into the film. And that's ultimately where I felt like I didn't have too much to hold on to by the end of it. And again, I like this film. I think it's very good. I think it's really well made, but maybe some of that ambiguity and some of that lost power is why I feel a little bit more distant from it than some people. So interestingly enough, the way that I felt about it was as if if you had come to your own interpretation about whether she did it or didn't, I feel like the movie ends in a way where you're not actually questioning anymore. You believe what you believe, and I think the movie works think, as an ending that your belief true. just automatically feels that way. And jumping back to those flashbacks that you were talking about, I thought those were very interestingly done also for the fact that they seem to be from Daniel's perspective in his mind. Yes, yeah, so when Daniel hears things, he has... I think a subjective flashback where he's picturing these things. But then there is what I would call an objective flashback that's only there because of the, the recording. Yes. Yeah. But the other two I thought were very interesting from his perspective because one is whether she killed him because they're going through all the theories in the trial of how she would have done it, which is actually kind of funny in its own way because everybody, including the persecution and the defense, come up with methods in which the husband either was murdered or committed suicide. I know, and there's kind of 
of a ridiculous scene where they're taking a dummy and throwing it out the window. <laughs> That's it's pretty funny. That shows um, definitely the absurdity of, of the justice system and trying to make an argument out of nothing. Oh, a lot of the humor that actually reminds yeah. me came from the prosecution, the guy that was playing the the persecution. Yeah, he was just grasping at anything he could. <laughs> and I know we have it in the same way in the states that the lawyers have to be very flowery and they have to tell a good story because people are moved by a good story more than they're moved by the truth. While we're on the defense and the prosecution, one thing I really like that the film does is you can feel yourself siding sometimes with the prosecution, siding sometimes with the defense. And then I think more often for me, finding both sides pretty ridiculous. <laughs> There's a lot of straws being grasped by both sides that are just, again, searching for any kind of story, any kind of argument that's going to resonate with the people in the crowd and the jurors. So I found that very enlightening. I found it sometimes funny and uh, certainly a little disheartening. I want to make a qu very quick recommendation, actually, which is a documentary on Netflix called The Staircase, where it was made into a kind of good, kind of okay, fictional HBO adaptation about the same thing. But I'd highly recommend watching the documentary that deals with a lot of these same things. And it gives you unprecedented behind the scenes access to making a case for somebody and whether they killed their wife or not. And it deals with a lot of these same issues in a way I think that is deeper. No offense to this film. But anyway, if anyone is interested in that subject matter. Cool. <laughs> I don't know where you to go from there. You should watch it. <laughs> I, I don't know where to go from there. I was just like, okay, how do I get back to the movie? I, I want to talk about the fight because it's my favorite scene in the movie. We should call this a spoiler territory. We're still not going to spoil the verdict or how the film ends or whatever, but there's a very pivotal scene about an hour and a half in, and I, if you're sensitive to spoilers, maybe you should you should turn off now and come back when you've seen the film. But there's a recording of an argument. You were sitting next to me during this. We saw this at a screening at Yale, which is really cool. They've been screening films of the film archive um, at Yale for a little bit, and I was kind of sitting like this. I was enjoying the film, but I was sitting, and then when the argument started happen I was like <laughs> whoa that argument opens so much ambiguity it's so rife with different interpretations not only of their marriage but if she had any motivation at all to kill him because beforehand I think the prosecution's case from my view was pretty lousy and then when I heard the argument I said wow that really makes me rethink what she thought of her husband really really interesting but beyond the ambiguity factor and the you know the true crime factor that's did she do it did she not i think that fight is just masterfully directed and masterfully acted it has such a slow escalation we've never thrown things at each other but you know couples have arguments and it has a very realistic kind of ticking up yeah yeah, yeah. you could see the tension building until it's a fever pitch it's an extraordinary scene it's one of my favorite scenes of the year what also is so great about that argument is that it puts into perspective it's like, oh, what if somebody had recorded maybe one of your worst moments in life? And you said something that you maybe shouldn't have said, but you said it in the heat of an argument and you got really mad. Mm -hmm. So I think the interpretation of that from an outsider perspective is everybody thinks so harshly of that. I was so interested more so in the argument than what maybe it had to do with whether she killed him or not. I know, I, I could have seen a whole movie about their marriage. Which, yeah. in a way, this is a whole movie about their marriage. It's just told from a third-person perspective through the court. Yeah, that argument actually reminded me both of the argument and Before Midnight. Yeah, me too. And the one in Marriage Story. The director, should say, makes an amazing decision, which is by the end, when it gets slightly physical, that's when she decides to not show the flashback anymore. The idea of leaving the recording playing, going back to the courtroom, and we only hear what's happening mm. with some sort of physical altercation is really chilling. By far my favorite part of the film, and certainly when I was most emotionally affected by it, I like to feel bad in movies. <laughs> to me, feeling bad is feeling good in movies, and that was a very good feel bad scene. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing I do wanna bring up briefly is the piano interludes that take place during the film. These almost worked as beautiful little chapter markers, bridging us into a new part of the movie. Which I didn't catch, by the way. Very oh, interesting, yeah. I absolutely loved how the tone of them almost felt different for every single one, like it was mimicking the tone of what that new chapter was going to feel like in a certain way. Mm -hmm. At the end, I can remember the most particular one, which it almost felt a little bit ominous, like, oh, the trial's coming to an end and the verdict is going to be reached. So yep. there's a little bit more weight in that one. So you're ready to go to grades? I am. I'm going to give Anatomy of a Fall a B, which may sound a little low because I know that you really liked it. I felt like there was maybe another story here that could have had a lot more power. With that ambiguity, with it being so devoted to did she do it? Did she not? What are the what are the details of this? Like, can we trust what she's saying? I think that all gets so murky by the end that I don't have too much to hold on to. Again, it's a really well made film. It's extremely well written. It's extremely well acted. I think there's so much about it that's good. I think that ultimately, a film that I give an A to is a film that really knocks me out. And I, I have to say this didn't do it. I don't want to give like 
anyone the impression that this is a bad film, that this is an unworthy Palme d'Or winner. I like this so much better than last year's Palme d'Or winner, Triangle of Sadness, if you want to you know, compare it on, on a Palme d'Or level at all. I thought this film was, was very good, uh, but not great. So you or anyone else saying that it's really great, totally understands. <laughs> it, it really, it, you're just, you're looking for something in the film that I wasn't looking for. That's all. Yeah. And I'm about to say it was really great because I give this movie an A. <laughs> I absolutely enjoyed the ambiguity. And that was actually one of my favorite things about the movie because I don't think the movie was actually about whether she did it or didn't do it. Mm -hmm. I think in the end, it's really about us. It's about what we interpret of her and her character. And this film does a beautiful job of showing that. There's this moment, very particular moment, where the camera decides to look at people in the audience at the trial, mm -hmm. in the courtroom. There are still shots that just look at people. And the way that these some of these people are dressed, some of the looks that they have on their faces, I got the impression that some of them are there for the show. They're not there because they care about her or her husband being murdered. They do not care about that. They care about the headlines. They care about the show. They are sucked up in the drama of it. I think that has so much to say on a societal level about all of us. I think of Britney Spears as a great example of that recently. Yeah, court TV exists. Yeah, <laughs> people are obsessed with these court dramas. They're obsessed with these murders. I think this film has something to say about that on so much of a deeper level that's beyond did she or didn't she do it. The thing that's really interesting about that is I think the ambiguity of did she do it or did she not do it is going to draw in a more commercial crowd. But I think the thing that may possibly go over a commercial crowd's head is how the film is commenting on that commercial crowd's <laughs> obsession with true crime in the first <laughs> place. So I agree with you. That's something I, I really like about the film. And that's it for a review of Anatomy of the Fall, which comes out October 13th and begins expanding every week after that. So it will come to a theater near you soon. If not, I hope you catch this on streaming because it is certainly worth looking for and we will see you next time. Yeah.